I was very young, and I can remember it as it were yesterday, and I can take you to the exact spot where it all transpired, where it happened. It was in the hill country of Texas, Marble Falls to be exact, where I experienced my very first echo. Now, it was a family thing. Uh, we would stand on this little rocky knoll, and they call them hollows on each side, and we would face this old barn that was located on top of the hill a little ways, and, and we finally realized that you could stand out there, and you could face the barn, and you could holler, Hello! And that barn would say, Hello! say what are you doing and it would say what what are you doing and it was uh it was awesome and just this mysterious manifestation to my sisters and I and and none less than a puzzling phenomena to say the least just simply called an echo an echo is nothing more than a repetition of sound that's produced by the reflection of sound waves. There are certain places that are noted for their outstanding echoes. There's a place in Spain. Anything that is spoken will echo back 17 times. There's a place in Milam, Italy. Anything that is spoken will echo back 70 times times and there's a place on the lake a lake in Ireland you can play the taps on a bugle they say and the tune is played back to you as distinctly as when it was played echoes nothing more than a reflection of sound produced by or the repetition of sound produced by the reflection of sound waves. Just, I'm sure you heard about the little boy who got home, he was mad, his mother asked him what the deal was, and he said, well, I was just coming home, and uh, he said, I passed by the little group of woods, and he said, uh, there was a boy out there in the woods, and he was mocking me, and she said, really? He said, everything that I would say to him, he would say back to me. I said, hello. He said, hello. And I said, who are you? And he said, who are you? And I said, what is your name? And he said, what is your name? And he said, mom, I got mad. And he said, I jumped the fence, went into the woods looking for the fella. He said, I couldn't find him. I was going to punch him in the nose. His mother said, tomorrow, why don't you go out to the same place? And why don't you just say out loud, I love you. And see what he says back to you. It is a reflection. The repetitious sound that goes forth. An echo. Another puzzling phenomenon for years has been the largest flying mammal that we call the bat. And these strange creatures, they fly miles in the dark up to speeds over 100 miles an hour. They can swoop in and out and through caverns and caves and never strike a wall and never touch one another. It's been a mystery and has been for years. And finally, scientists captured a group of bats, and uh, they wanted to conduct this live study or an analysis on their actions. And the scientists stretched a small wire across the cavern wall, just, uh, just the size of a thread. And they turned some bat loose in that cavern. And they never hit the wall, they never touched one another, but just flew right on through it like nothing was there. 
And so the scientists blindfolded them, thinking that just maybe they, they see in the dark. And so, so they blindfolded them, and they turned them loose. And again, with perfect position, they flew, never touching the sides of the wall, and neither touching each other or even the wire. And so they taped shut their ears and their mouth. And with eyes wide open, they crashed into the sides of the wall. They hit the wire. They ran into one another. The investigation revealed that, sa- that bats, they sound off a high, shrill note when they fly. And the sound that they create It causes vibration which echoes back to them from the object that is in their path. And these highly sensitive ears of the bat acted as receivers for the echoed sound. And it was determined what they send out comes back to them. I said what they send out is going to come back to them. And they called it the echo principle. And I want to talk about that for just a little bit. The wise preacher wrote this in Ecclesiastes 11. Cast thy bread upon the water, for thou shalt find it after many days. Go ahead, throw it out. It's going to come back to you. And then the greatest preacher of them all in Mark 4 said he said unto them take heed what you hear with what measure you might it shall be measured to you and unto you that hear shall more be given let me give you a translation to that be careful what you hear the measure of thought that you give it will be the measure that comes back to you It's called the echo principle. Be careful what you say about a situation in life. Be careful not to judge because judgment has a way of coming back. It's an echo principle, but it also works in the spirit world. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth... I will draw all men unto me. If you send praises up, I'm going to send praises down. If you glorify me, then I'm going to bless you. So the more we worship and the more we praise, the more I'm going to be lifted up out of my despondency and my discouragement. Now, let me pastor just a little bit. This won't cost you nothing. This is free. These praise singers, these musicians, they're not up here to try to display talent or to impress you with their gifts. They are ushering you and I in to the presence of God. Now is our time to hear God's word Prior to this, it's our time to worship God and get involved in our praise to the Lord. That's good right there. If a preacher would have said that, I would have shouted, amen. Now listen, I can't play a keyboard. I can't play drums. I can't play guitar, bass. I can't do all that. I can't do that. I can't sing nothing. But God has put two instruments at the end of my arm. It's called hands. Oh, come on now. And he gave me a voice. And that's why Psalm 47 said, Oh, clap your hands. Oh, ye people. And shout unto God with the voice of triumph. 
Praise God. Hallelujah. Sing it, sister. Preach, pastor. That's the way to go. I promise you, if you would get involved with your instrument, at the end of a service, the glory of God would have fallen and revival would break out and you and I leave blessed. Because the more I put into a church service, the more it's going to come back to me. It's an echo principle. What you and I send out comes back to us. Now, I got all bunged up, and I've told the story several years ago with a cardiac arrest, fell out of deer stand. And so I, I, can't, I can't run, and I'd like to, but I just can't. I can't stand a whole long time, but they had a young boy, he was sitting like right here, and his name was Noah. And Noah was a good friend of mine, and he was just a young fella. And, and uh, when we start having the Holy Ghost move around there, and uh, I'd kind of get this, uh, you know, this crazy idea of running, and I knew I couldn't. So I'd tell Noah, Noah, why don't you run for me? Some of y'all got some ideas going on right now. And old Noah would take off and he'd run around the building. He'd come on around and boy, I'd just, and I'd tell everybody that was that, you know, that's, that's my shouting right there. That's my run. And then we had another move with God and, and I told old Noah, I said, Noah, why don't you run around the building for me? I need a lap. So he just took off and man, he run. Well, he's a young guy and man, he was taking off and when he got over here, Holy Ghost was still on me, you know, and and uh, I, I still had to want to. I just and so I said, Noah, do another one for me. And so he just took off. He run another one and come back. Well, another service we had a breakout and service was going good. And I said, Noah, I need somebody to run for me. And Noah jumped out and he run around. And when he turned that corner over there, I looked at him and he said. This one's for me. <laughs> and he just kept running. You know, every now and then, if you get involved, you, you, you just kind of want to. You just, you just kind of be a part of it. It's called an echo principle. The more prayer that I send up, the more blessings are going to come back and more miracles and signs and wonders are going to come. Brother Nathan, I say this to our young people. God bless you so much. It's good news. I love to hear that. I believe our churches are in good hands. And I was in Hobbs, New Mexico, the wife and I. And there was a young man there, just barely 20 probably, and he had been fasting for a move of God and while we were there, and he'd been praying. And I got finished preaching one night, and, and uh, there was a lady came down, and wasn't long God filled her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we had a new couple in the back over here and a couple over here. And so I decided to go and greet them. And, and so I walked down, and I told them how good it was to have them. And, Appreciate their attendance. And, and when I started walking over to the other one, I saw Nathan. Nathan was talking to this, this couple over here. It was an elderly lady and a, a young boy, her son. He was in his probably early 30s. And I saw Nathan talking to him, so I backed off. And after a while, I saw Nathan turn around and he grabbed a, he grabbed a, a, a wheelchair. And he said, uh, oh. I'm going to help you in it. He said, we're going to go to the front and pray. And, and so uh, her son helped her, Nathan, and got her in that wheelchair. And she went on down the aisle and got her in the front. And now, you got to remember, Nathan's been praying. And he's been fasting for God to do something. 
It's an echo principle. And so they come and they parked that wheelchair right up there in front. And we prayed, the whole church prayed. And Nathan was right there close. And finally Nathan said, ma'am, said, you're going to walk. God's going to heal you. You can do that when you've been praying and fasting. When you realize what you put out is going to come back. And, his, and her son looked at him and said, she has never walked in my life. Mama can't walk. And he said, oh yeah, Mama's going to walk today. <laughs> and uh, I saw him reach down, grab her by the hand. And the son immediately got on the other side to help, and she stood up for her first time and walked right across the building, all the way over here, turned around, and walked all the way back. Why? Because somebody, a young person, decided what I put out is going to come back to me. God is going to, uh, he's going to apply this echo principle. Every prayer you pray is going to return. Revelations 8 and 3, the angel came to the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense. And the smoke of the incense, which came from the prayers of the saints, ascended before God out of the angel's hands. Whatever you pray, it's going to go up. And then God's going to return it right back to you. There was a lady got up every morning and she would go to the church. This was in Burr Ferry, Louisiana, right out of Leesville. And, and she'd get up every morning and go pray for her husband at the church. And he was a rascal. He, he was. And so uh, she did this for years. And one morning she got up. And uh, started out the door, and he said, I, I know where you're going. said, you're going to church pray for me, aren't you? She said, yes, I am. He said, why don't we just have prayer right here? And so they prayed in the living room, and God filled that man with the baptism of the Holy Ghost right there in his living room. <laughs> why? Because a mother or uh, a wife decided, if I keep putting out enough, it's going to return back to me. It's going to come back. Whatever I bring up, God's going to bring down. They baptized him in Jesus' name, and the pastor said when he come up out of that watery grave, he was talking in tongues again, and he had stopped talking in tongues, and he would say, don't stop praying for your friends. And he'd talk in tongues a little bit. He said, don't stop praying for your family. And he'd go back to talking in tongues again. Don't stop praying for your spouse. And he'd go back to talking in tongues again. I'm telling you, you keep praying. It's going to come back. It also works in giving. The more I give to the kingdom of God, the more blessed I'm going to become. Now we're, we're gone most weekends, but on Wednesday nights, we go to Martin Pentecostal Church. Now, you, you all don't know where it's at, and if I put it, if I gave you the address and you put it in a, a GPS, you still couldn't find it. <laughs> it's way, way out in the woods, and and brother and sister Sales has been a good friend for us for years. Years ago, he lived in Houghton out of Shreveport. And, and this, little, this little small uh, little church in Martin, they only had three ladies that was left. The church was bad shape. And, and uh, so brother Sales was asked to go down there and keep a weekend for him and preach and so he did, and, and they preached. And he said when there was only three elderly ladies there, and, and when he got finished preaching, one of the ladies came up to him, and she had an envelope, and she said, uh, here's the offering, preacher. 
She said, I sure wish there was more, but we just a little small, poor church. And he thanked them, and he got in his car, and he and his wife started driving down the road, and, and he finally turned to his wife, and he said, why don't you open up the envelope and see how much we got? <laughs> she opened it up, and she said, $30. He said, well, good. He said, I gave 20. <laughs> and she said, I gave 10. <laughs> but you got to know Sister Sale, she's sweet. She looked at Brother Sales and said, you know what? If we'd have gave more, we'd have got more. <laughs> That's the principle of giving. You put it out, it's going to return right back to you. Now, I'm going to throw this out. It won't cost you nothing. You're not going to be financially blessed just because a prophetic preacher comes by and says you're fixing to be rich. If you don't give, you're not getting. I'll take a Baptist nod right there. Okay, let me get on something y'all like. Can you imagine what would happen if everybody in a church would become involved? Not just praise singers, not just musicians, but if everybody got involved. There, there's a children's story. It's titled Stone Soup. Some of you remember. It's about these soldiers who came out of the jungle and found this little town, and, and they, they were starving to death, and so they, they went and, to one house and said, do y'all have anything that we could eat? No, I'm sorry, we don't have anything. So they went to the next house said, Do you have anything you could spare? We're starving, hadn't eaten in a long time. No, we don't, we don't have anything. And so the soldiers got an idea. They got this big gumbo pot. They filled it with water. And they put these stones they washed some rocks and they put them in that big pot. And they got outside and built a big fire and put that pot and they started stirring those rocks, those stones. Somebody came along and said, what are, what are y'all doing? They said, well, we're making a stone soup. Ugh. That don't sound good. They said, oh, yeah, it's delicious. Said, you know, but if we had just a little cabbage, boy, it would really make it. And that lady said, well, I don't have a lot, but I got a little cabbage. I'll go get it. And they put it in there. So they started stirring it. Somebody else came by, curious. You know, people are nosy, and so they come by and said, what are y'all doing? Said, we're making a stone soup. Oh, that don't sound good. Oh, yeah, it, it's delicious. Said, what would make it a little better if we had just a few carrots? They said, well, we, I got a few carrots at the house. Not many, but I got a few. I, I'll go get them. And so they came back. And, and so then that went on, and they got celery and turnip, turnips and potatoes and onions and Tony Sassery and Tabasco and And one by one, they added all of this into the pot. And finally, the soldier mentioned, he said, boy, if we just had one little piece of meat, man, we could cut up and put in there. You talk about a wonderful soup. And one man said, you know what? I don't have a big piece, but I got a little piece. I'll go get it. And so they cut it up, and they put it in there and stirred it up. And they, they served the entire village with that one pot of stone soup because everybody put in a little bit into the pot. Do you realize what would happen if we all walked in the door and every one of us would just put in a little bit? 
They're clapping. Their hands are raised. They're shouting hallelujah. They're saying that's it. Praise God and so forth. Do you realize the anointing of God that would touch our lives? I wish somebody to help me right now. I just feel God walk in here. I came to do my part. You better shut that down. My defibrillator's gonna go off. <laughs> Why don't we just try that one more time? Somebody up here start shouting. Somebody right here start clapping your hands. Somebody over here shout hallelujah. Somebody said that's the way to go, God. Come on, young people, give God praise. We're fixing to feed Monroe. We're fixing to feed our community. Everybody's going to put in a little bit. Okay, y'all sit down. People usually stand when they want you to quit. A little boy, if I read it right, he offered his lunch, and he fed 5,000. I read of a poor widow that offered her last little bit of oil and meal that was left. And she had an oil well in the living room and a wheat field in the kitchen. Now, now I'm going to get real serious. Uh, you know what? I, got a, I have a, a degree in industrial tech. Went, I got a degree in uh, biblical theology and so forth. And I pastored close to 40 years and been preaching over 50 and so when I decided I was going to retire, I had to make me a retirement plan. And so I realized I've been doing all this for so long. I'm old. I, I get tired quicker. I, I take more naps. I sleep less at night. And I get up much earlier. I don't have nothing to do, and I got all day long to do it. What I don't finish today, I'll try to work on it tomorrow. But here, I had a retirement plan that I was going to find me a good church. And I was going to come in late and I was going to leave early. And I was going to find that church and I was going to criticize the music. And I was going to complain about all these new songs they're singing. That's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to complain about the sound system. And I was going to gripe about the air condition. Y'all don't have a mic on. That, that's. And I wanted to drive up in my brand new truck and talk about the good old days. And then I wanted to tell the pastor that the plants out on the back of the church needed watering. And there was a spot on the carpet in the storage room. I'm doing all right? Well, they got quiet on me. And then I, I couldn't wait till a Christmas banquet so I could gripe about what color the tablecloth was. And I could fuss about the food. <laughs> this was my favorite. I couldn't wait. I'm still waiting. It's going to happen. I, could, I can't wait until about three minutes before service time. I want to go in and tell the pastor that the toilets are plugged. Like he needs to know that right before he preaches.
<laughs> oh, I know. I got a coon tree right here. Listen to me. Listen to me. I know that doesn't happen in Monroe. But just in the South. But it dawned on me when I retired. It dawned on me. I'm a great, great grandson of a grandmother that was killed walking to church blind at 91 years of age. And then I realized that I have children who are watching me. And I have grandchildren who are watching and mimicking me. And not only do I come to give glory to God, but I'm making an investment into the future of my family and this church. That makes all that other stuff unnecessary. Oh God. One of our youth pastors told it. He said every youth service night, these parents, certain parents would drop off their son for youth service, but they did not attend. And one day, the youth leader decided to pay the, the boy a visit. So he went and parked right in the front of the house was a, a brand new sports car. And the boy's dad answered the door, and there was a brief little introduction, and then the young pastor, youth pastor, asked the father, just kind of an icebreaker, said, can I borrow your new car? I'd like to take a spin around the block. And the father nearly went through the roof. He said, why, you're a total stranger to me, and you want me to loan you my most valuable possession. And the youth leader jokingly persisted, and he said, you know, I won't be long. I'll just make a quick block, and I'll be back. And the daddy said, you must take me for a fool, because I don't even know you. You want to take that valuable possession. And the youth leader looked at him and said, You know, for two years now, you've dropped your boy off at youth service. And you don't even know me. And you don't even know what I teach. And you have never attended to see what we're doing. But you trusted your son to me but you won't trust your car to me. Which is more valuable, your son or your car? Come on, mamas and dads. We have an investment right over here. I said we have the most valuable investment right here and across. I'm telling you it's worth us coming to church and worshiping and praising God and lifting up our voices and giving God glory. Every service, listen to me, every service, whether I get involved or not, I'm teaching my children something. Whether I worship or whether I don't worship, I'm teaching them something. My response to what somebody says about the church, I'm teaching them something. In my conversation about the church, I'm teaching them something. Praise God. There was a young man one time observed an elderly man across the fence, and he went over there and said, well, what are you doing? And this 80-year-old man said, well, I'm planting an apple orchard. And he would reach for a sapling and he would painstakingly prepare the soil. He would plant that little tiny sapling and water it. And after watching this a while, the, the boy looked at the old man and said, you don't expect eating apples from this orchard, do you? And the old man said, nope. 
but somebody will. And he puts another one. You may not see it happen in your lifetime. You may not see your child saved. You may not see your spouse saved, but somebody will. If you keep worshiping and keep praising and stay loyal to God and faithful to church, you will in the long run. Hallelujah. God is going to let you be blessed. Like the man walking along the seashore picking up these starfish and throwing them into the ocean and, and they were scattered all over the beach and one man said, what are you doing? He said, I'm saving starfish. He said, my Lord, man, look at all the starfish on the beach. And he bent down, picked up one more, threw it in the gulf, and he said, I just saved that one. No matter what you do or how hard it may seem, just keep saving. Just keep worshiping. Just keep praying. Just keep praising him. Years ago, a man by the name of Edward Lawrence, he came up with this apostasies that he presented to the New York Academy of Science. He and his theory was laughed out of the conference. His theory simply stated that a butterfly can flap its wings and set molecules of air into motion which would move other molecules of air in turn move and more molecules and eventually capable of starting a hurricane on the other side of the planet. And it was called the butterfly effect. But what he had proposed was considered ridiculous and silly. However, it was fascinating and interesting. The butterfly effect, though he was laughed out of that conference, was never forgotten, and it became the topic again of science fiction. And 30 years later, physics scientists and professors working from different labs across the country and universities from around the world came up to this one startling conclusion that the butterfly effect is actually factual and realistic. What you and I do does affect others. It's going to start something in the heavenlies. And that glory of God is going to fall. What we do here on earth is going to affect the kingdom of God. Praise God. I close with this story. A very wealthy man called, a con called this certain contractor and he told him, he said, I'd like for you to build me a house. He said, I'm going to be out of the country, and, but I trust you. So I'm going to give you all the money up front. And when I come back, I just want to see the house. And so the young contractor, seeing the opportunity to make a little extra money, the contractor cut every corner that he could. He used the cheapest of material. Because he already had money in hand, he wanted just to make a little more money. And finally, the house was completed. And he called the wealthy man to show him the finished product. It was then that the wealthy man explained, You see, your dad was good to me years ago, and I never had a chance to help him. So I wanted to help you. In order to pay you for kindness, you have just built your own house. 
I asked you to build it because I knew you would build the kind of house that you would like to live in. Let's stand. Every one of us in this house, we're building a house. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye shall, and you are not your own. As you and I maneuver through the caves and the caverns of this world, remember what you send out is going to come back. And I challenge you, don't go cheap on your salvation. Don't cut corners. Don't guess. Because we're going to live in this thing. It's going to be ours. I'm building a house. Don't go cheap on the materials. What you put into the kingdom of God is going to return back to you. That's why Galatians 6 and 7, the writer said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. And whatsoever a man shall he also reap. Whatever you throw out, don't come back. He said in verse 8, He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, everybody say due season. That's when God owes it to us. He's going to give it to us. In due season, we shall, we're going to reap if we sowed. And whatever you, whatever you sowed, whether it's of the flesh or of the spirit, it's coming back. That's why he said, let us do good unto all men. He didn't stop there. He said, especially unto them that are of the household of faith. <laughs> if you will, hunger and thirst after righteousness, you're going to be filled. If you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all these other things are going to be added right unto you. What you say this morning, we gather around the front. If you feel uncomfortable with that, I understand. It's no problem. But we're going to lift up our voices with these singers and we're going to worship and praise. If you're a guest here today, maybe you, you're not filled with God's Spirit. We, we invite you. No pressure. But we invite you to come stand with us and come on, just come be a part of our church. Whatever we do right now is going to echo right on through heaven. <laughs>